happy Sabbath. I am so, so glad that you're back with us again. And we are studying through the book of Jonah. Today is part two. I am praying that last week was a blessing to you. And um, if it wasn't, I think that this, this week's message is going to be even better. Because last week we were starting with a couple of themes. And this week we take some of them and draw them even further while introducing some more things. And again, I love the idea of a series where you can develop different ideas that all sort of have a cohesive center point. So um, so what we'll do is we'll pray. Would you pray with me? Um, Heavenly Father, just want to ask that you will be with us now as we open scripture. Lord, we pray that you would open us. Heavenly Father, as we turn our attention to the text, help us to turn our attention in a special way to our Savior. Lord, you you have already ministered to us um, throughout the Sabbath day in a, ver- in a variety of ways. Lord, I just pray that as you come in a special way through your word, that you would open our hearts to receive something unique, something new, something fresh. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So last week what we did was we started this, we started this series, um, Arise and Go. And I'll, I'll just share that with you here. Arise and go. And I know I put this up last week. Um, there is you. I, I like to break it up into these six different sections, and we've got two halves, right? So what we did last week was we studied the first part, the first section, Jonah chapter one, verses one through three. And I know I mentioned this last week, but there's a, a lot of symmetry between chapter one and chapter three. You know, those first three verses, and then. Today, we're going to be in that second section. I've grayed out that first section because we already looked at it. So now we're going to be in the buildup, Jonah chapter 1, verses 4 through 16. And that's it's it's paralleled by later when Jonah is with the Ninevites. There's a lot of similarities. We won't look at all of them. We probably won't even look at many of them. But I just point this out because I think sometimes we forget that the Bible writers and the authors that were scripting the, the scripture narrative um, – we forget how intelligent they were, right? We think, oh, they're so old. They're so primitive, right? They're so dumb, right? They couldn't possibly be as new and as modern, as smart as we were. When in fact, they were so much smarter than we were. I mean, we think old, you know, monkeys and, you know, they were they were not not civilized like us. The, the, the author of the book of Jonah was incredibly, incredibly intelligent. So, So we'll just start by reading... Jonah chapter 1, go with me to Jonah chapter 1, and we'll just start by reading verses 4 and 5. Jonah chapter 1, I'll be reading here from from the New King James Version. It says, but the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea. There was a mighty tempest on the sea, so the ship was about to be broken up. Then the mariners were afraid, and every man cried out to his God threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest part of the ship, had lain down and was fast asleep. So one of the one of the points that we could have made last week, but that we did not, I, I wanted to save it for today. One of the points that we could have made last week is that Jonah saw his decisions horizontally, but God saw his diso- disobedience vertically, right? Jonah saw his disobedience on the horizontal level, but God actually saw his disobedience vertically. I'll just stop sharing just for a moment. Um, Jonah thinks, uh, you know, oh, when I run from God, I'm going to run to Tarshish. You know, I don't I don't have to, um, you know, I'm, I'm not running down. I'm going west. I'm going left on the map. But in verse three that we looked at last week, it says that Jonah went down. And then he went down again. I don't know if I emphasized that last week, but here in verse four and verse five, it says he went down two more times. It's as if the author wants you to notice that when you disobey God, you're going in a downward direction. You're going down, right? Jonah wasn't going south. The author isn't saying, okay, he went south. No, he clearly went west, but in disobeying God, you go down. Your life gets worse. See, you and I believe that when we turn away from God, you know, we're moving in the horizontal level. But in fact, God sees it vertically because he sees us getting worse. Our life is descending. Our life is getting worse. And and he went down into the bottom of the ship and lay down. The author is pointing something out. See, if you remember, we looked at last week, Jonah was told to arise, get up, get up. 
arise in the original Hebrew, it's kum. And then cry out is kra. Kum, kra. Arise and cry out. And that's going to become big for us in a minute. But anytime God calls you to something, he calls you to get up, to go closer to him. Get up, go up, right? You think your disobedience isn't serious. You think, oh, if I do something, it's probably not going to affect me that much. Right? A little bit of you know, pornography in my life is not really going to affect me. Maybe, if anything, it'll affect my horizontal relationships. God sees that disobedience vertically. Your life is going down in a way. Eating unhealthy things, oh, it's not that big of a deal, right? Eating a little bit of meat or uh, too much meat or eating unclean meat or eating too much sugar, not really exercising. I'm not going to take care of my body. It doesn't really affect me that much. God says, no, it does. It really does. See, if you were going to ask Jonah, if you were going to ask him, Jonah, do you want to die? He would He would have said, no, of course not. See, there is a way that seems right to a man. I love this proverb. But in the end, it leads to death, right? Again, you could ask Jonah, Jonah, do you want to die? He would have been like, no, of course not. But when you run away from God, you're not just running away on the horizontal. You're going down to death. Here's another verse that I really like. Uh, the point that we made last week, Nineveh with God is better than Tarshish without him. Um, here's the proverb that I was referencing. Proverbs 8 verse 36 says, he who sins against me wrongs his own soul and all those who hate me love death, right? Again, if you would have asked him, he would have said, no, I just want to go to Tarshish. I want to sit on the beach. But he only sees horizontally what God sees vertically. What seemed right to Jonah, God could see the end of it. See, you think you're going horizontally, but in fact, you're going down to, to your own death. Oh, now watch this. This is where it gets, this is where it takes off. Watch this in verse six. Watch this in verse six. So the captain, Jonah chapter one, verse six. Oh, I'm so excited for this. So the captain came to him and said to him, what do you mean sleeper? And then what's the very next word? Guess what? Same Hebrew word, arise, get up, arise, and then call on your God. Guess what? Same Hebrew word. What do you mean, sleeper? Arise, kum, same one in same uh, same Hebrew word as in verse uh, verse two. Arise, go to Nineveh and cry out against it. Right, that's verse two. Now verse six. Arise, cry out to your God, call on your God. Arise, kum, kra. Perhaps your God will consider us that we may not perish. Here's the guys. This is amazing. This is amazing. This should just be like blowing you away. See, the very command that Jonah heard from God, arise and cry out against Nineveh, cry out against them. That's the command he's running away from. And he's woken up in the middle of a storm. And what does he hear? But he hears a Gentile ship captain saying the exact same thing that God had just told him, arise and cry out. And Jonah would have thought, well, what? What did you just say? It sounds a little familiar. We can't run from God. God is going to chase after you. And again, not because he doesn't love you, but because he does. And he knows, and we talked about this last week, your happiness is bound up in a connection with him. You cannot be happy disconnected from him. Jonah would have thought, this is the thing I'm running away from. Kum, kra, right? Arise and cry out. Like, oh, that sounds familiar. So verse 7, watch this in verse 7. We're going to keep reading. Verse seven says, they said to one another, come, let us cast lots that we may know for whose trouble this, whose cause this trouble has come upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. And now he says, watch this, uh, after the lot falls on Jonah, oops, sorry, verse eight. Then they tell him, then they said to him, please tell us for whose cause is this trouble upon us? And what is your occupation? Where do you come from? From what country? And of what people are you? And then now he thinks to stand up and say something. Verse nine, so he said to them, I am a Hebrew. I fear the Lord, the God of heaven. Do you really, Jonah? That's my own internal. Do you? <laughs> Why are you running away? Um, who made the sea and the dry land? Now, this is, listen, this is just another thing that should be jumping off the page. Um, Jonah is asleep and his sleepy withdrawal from the reality and from other people struggling is a warning to the church. See, when we're studying through the book of Jonah, lessons should be staring us in the face. And this is a huge one. 
Jonah is disconnected from reality. He's disconnected from the pain and the struggles of the people around him. He's sleeping. See, the mayor of your local city or the governor of your local area, he could come up to you, knock on, knock on your local Seventh-day Adventist church and say, hey, what are you doing? Why are you guys asleep? What are you doing to help the people around you? Are you blind to their struggle? Uh, this is why our church needs to be helping the local community, right? Do you, do you, are you aware? Are you aware that anxiety is up? Are you aware that suicide is up? Are you aware that, you know, there's, there's drug trafficking going on in your area or whatever it is in your local area? Are you aware or are you asleep at the bottom of the boat? The, if the people in our community can come to us and say, how are you sleeping? What do you mean, sleeper? Arise and do something. The world is falling apart. There's a storm going on all around us. And you're asleep at the bottom of the boat? And you claim to be a Christian? Ooh. What if our community came to us and said, don't you see there are people? You claim to believe in God. You claim to believe in doing good works. You claim faith without works is dead. What are you doing sleeping? Let me just remind you, the way that they found Jonah, this this should this this is another by the way. Side point. People that come and tell me, you know, how could you possibly be a Christian? How could you possibly believe in the Bible? How could you possibly like, oh, that book is so old. And I think, have you read it? Have you read it? I mean, the things that are popping out in scripture are just there's no way a human could have written this without divine help. No way. Watch this point. This is this is another one of the internal things that just alerts me. Of course, there's no way a human could have written this so beautifully. So think about this. The reason that they found Jonah was because they were looking for dead weight, things to throw off the ship, right? So secondary sails, tertiary sails, there's a storm going on all around them. What can we throw off? What is not that big of a deal? Let's throw off some cargo. Let's throw off some boxes. Let's throw off. Uh, oh, there's, oh. There's a person there. They were looking for dead weight to throw off. And Jonah was among the dead weight. That's how they found him. See, he was considered, and the author is scripting this so well. He was considered to be dead weight. Are we considered dead weight in our community? Or are we helping the needs of the people around us? That is what this, would anybody even notice if your local SDA church was gone? Because if the answer is no, then we're just dead weight. You know, the, the people in your local co community could, you know, oh, let's look for a building that's not doing any good, that's not doing anything to help our local community. We'll just bulldoze the down. Oh, there's a church over there. They don't do anything. They come once a week. They sit there, they sing some songs, eat some food. Then they go home. They don't really do anything to benefit the community or help the people around them. They're a social club. Let's bulldoze that building down and you know, build a strip mall, something really important where people can get their nails done. Like, are we dead weight? We have to be meeting the needs of our community. Jonah wasn't. Jonah was asleep in the bottom of the boat. Now, here's something else. We started, I started to point this out just a moment ago, but here's a continuation of that theme. Sometimes the voice of God comes through someone else. It comes through a friend. It can come through a critic. It can come through a boss. It can come through your pastor. It can come through a parent. Jonah heard from God, get up, cry out against Nineveh so they don't perish. Jonah runs. Then the captain comes and says, get up and cry out to God, right? Same word, get up, cry out. Two times, arise and cry out. Same Hebrew word, Sometimes the voice of God comes to us. If we're ignoring God, then God will come and talk to us from other people, right? Our friends, maybe an enemy. I've had this happen to me dozens of times, right? We'll be sitting and we'll be talking, you know, maybe you, it's happened to you. You'll be sitting and talking with someone and they say something and it's as if the voice of God just came speaking through that person. I've had it happen to me dozens of times, right? I'll hear someone say something and I'll think, whoa, I know that was God speaking to me through you. Right. I'll give you an example. Uh, I'll give you an example. A couple of a couple of, I don't know, years ago before I moved out of my house, the house, you know, with my parents into, you know, move in with my wife. Um, just I was in a disagreement. I was, you know, 23 years old, 22 years old. This was, you know, eight, nine years ago. And um, 
in a disagreement, it happens, right? Disagreement with my parents. And I was arguing my case, you know, pointing out why I was correct and why my parents should let me do whatever I wanted to do. You know, I was in full testosterone manhood, um, wanting to do what I wanted to do. Uh, I wasn't being disrespectful. I was just saying, mom, you know, you should let me do this. Wouldn't you know it? In walks my brother. And he said, yeah, but Ryan, you don't realize this, but you're being a little bit selfish right now. And I thought, who, who do you, and my brother was 17 at the time, brother. And I said, brother, you, <laughs> adults are talking, right? You know, I was, who asked you anyway? Listen, God can speak to us through a friend, through a spouse. He can speak to us through our church members. He can even speak to us through a brother or through someone who doesn't like us. God speaks to us through other people. God speak to us, speaks to us through other people. You, and, and the converse is very true. You can be the voice of God to someone else. You can be the voice of God to your pastor. Hopefully on occasion, he can be the voice of God to you, um, he or she. Listen, it takes community. The church needs to be a community because God does not generally speak sonorously through the heavens saying, you know, this big booming, you know, my son, my son, listen, listen, listen. Like it doesn't happen. Usually the voice of God is heard through community and we need to be held accountable. God will hold us accountable through the voices of the people around us. So another point that's just staring us in the face, when we're not acting the way that we're supposed to be acting as Christians, non-believers have a right to expect believers to act like believers. Can you say amen? The non-believing captain, the Gentile captain, goes down and says, Aren't you supposed to be a, like a believer in God, right? Because you're not acting like one. For those of us who claim to be Christians, they take the name of Christ. Those of us who claim to be Seventh-day Adventists, if there's an awareness around you that you're a Christian, they have a right to expect you to act like a Christian, right? I mean, if you're a business owner and you're dishonest in business, people have a right to say, hey, you're not acting like the Christ that you claim you believe in. And if I'm, as a father, if I'm being abusive or unsupportive or impatient with my daughter, if I'm unsupportive as a husband to my to my wife, if, you know, if I'm disrespectful, if people could say, you're not acting the way that you should. You're claiming to be a Christian. Non-believers have a right to expect believers to act like believers. Non-believers have a right to expect Christians to act like Christians. We expect firemen to put out fires. We expect doctors to put bandages on our wounds and to heal us up when we're, when we're not doing well. We expect bankers to be honest with our money and give us the right change, people should be able to expect Christians to act like Christians. Not that you're perfect, right? Not that you're perfect. I mean, no one's perfect. But don't be sleeping at the bottom of the boat. Non-believers have a right to expect us to believe, to, to act like the Christ that we say we believe in. So verse 9 says, verse 9 says, uh, I am a Hebrew. Jonah said to them, I am a Hebrew. I fear the Lord. Do you really, Jonah? I meet people all the time who say, I'm a Christian. And I think in my head, and sometimes out loud, I'll even say, are you? Are you really? And that's not me being judgmental. That's not me saying, you know, judging their salvation or judging their connection with God. But by their actions, I can I can sense, are, are you really? Right? Again, I'm not being judgmental. I'm not placing myself in the place of God, like James would say, mm -hmm. um, in the book of James, it would later say, um, no, but if you take on the moniker of Christian, the moniker or the name of seven eminence, we deserve to be scrutinized and held accountable. If we're going to call ourselves Christians, people should expect us to act like Christians. Oh, and I love this point. Watch this. This reminds me of Romans chapter two, Romans chapter two, verses 14 and 15. Some of you guys would know this verse. Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law or Torah, right, they don't have the Old Testament. They don't have the Old Testament. When they don't have the Old Testament, they do by nature the things that the Old Testament requires. They are the law for themselves. Even though they don't have the law, they show the work of the law is written in their hearts, right? They don't have the Old Testament, but they live it out. And here's this radical notion that Jonah didn't understand. God is not excluding Gentiles. God isn't excluding non-Christians from heaven because they're non-Christian. Maybe they've had no exposure. Maybe they had no opportunity. Maybe they were turned away from religion because a pastor or an elder did something inappropriate to them. They just, they didn't know what God was like, but they're still living it out in their, in their hearts. I love this point from, from Ellen White, who's 
a, a woman by the name of Ellen White is, um, she was one of the founders of Seventh-day Adventist Church. She wrote this in the book, The Desire of Ages. She says, even among the heathen are those who have cherished the spirit of kindness before the words of life have fallen on their ears. They've befriended missionaries, ministering to them at the peril of their own lives. See, I just love this idea. Isn't God just overly fair? Right? They don't hear it from people, but they hear God in nature, and they're recognized as the children of God. There are people that worship God and don't know it. That's what she's saying. There's heathens who have who they cherish the spirit of kindness, and before the words of life have even fallen on their ears, they are recognized as children of God. Here's a continuation. Among the heathen are those who worship God ignorantly. By the way, this is what the sailors were doing. Jonah says, throw me overboard, and they're trying to save him. They don't want to throw him overboard. They're acting more righteous than him. She says, among the heathen are those who worship God ignorantly, those to whom the light of is never brought by human instrumentality, yet they will not perish. Those, though ignorant of the written law of God, they have heard his voice speaking to them in nature and have done the things the law required. Their works are evidence the Holy Spirit has touched their hearts and they are recognized as children of God. Can you say amen? Can you say amen? As you read through this section of Jonah, you should find yourself asking, like, who is converted and who is the wicked? Is Jonah really God's man? And are the Gentiles really heathens and wicked? Because Jonah is sleeping and the Gentiles seem to be saved. And by the way, this isn't just Jonah. Jesus was on earth and he told the story of the Samaritan who believed very similar to these sailors. The Samaritan, oh, thought to be unholy. He wasn't Jewish, right? But in reality, he's putting bandages on the wounds of this other man. He takes care of this other man. And the Pharisees and the Levites, they walk right by. Tisk, tisk, tisk. Here's a great way to say what they're, what, what. Ellen White is, is saying, and what Paul is saying, there are many non-Christian Christians, but there's also a lot of Christian non-Christians. There's Just because you show up to church on Sabbath morning does not make you a Christian, just like going to a car shop doesn't make you a mechanic. The name Christian doesn't mean anything. Has God penetrated your heart? That's the point. Because God is working with everyone everywhere. He's working with these Gentiles on the boat. He's working with Gentiles in Tarshish, like we read last week, God said, remember last week we, we studied uh, in Isaiah chapter 66, God says, you see icky people, you see Gentiles and disgusting people. I see sons and daughters. I see Levites and priests. I don't know if you feel the same oppressiveness that I feel sometimes when I'm, you know, I'm on an air, airplane, right? Especially pre, pre-pandemic, I would be on an airplane and I would be a little bit worried thinking, you know, there's a lot of people here and I don't have time or the ability to preach to everybody. You know, I feel like a little bit of heaviness and oppression, like, you know, or I'll be in a traffic jam and I hear, you know, the music from the cars around me. And I think there's just so many people here. How are all these people going to hear the good news? And I just get bombarded with this idea, Ryan, you need to pray more than you are. Because God is there before I'm there. God is working on hearts before I get there. And if I never make it there, God is not constrained by human limitations. God can go where missionaries have never gone. God can go there. Of course, he's calling you to go there. But if you refuse, like Jonah refused, God is still working with them. So that's why he calls us arise and go and strengthen what I'm already doing. So we're going to get to the final point here. Jonah chapter 1, verses 13. We're going to read through 13, 14, and 15. Uh, Actually, sorry, we'll read down through verse 10. Then the the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, Why have you done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more tempestuous. It's getting worse. And he said to them, Pick me up. Throw me into the sea, and the sea will become calm for you. For I know that this is because of me. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to land. They're trying. They're trying to save Jonah. Verse 13. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to return to land, but they could not, for the sea continued to grow more tempestuous. Second time it says that. More tempestuous. Therefore, they cried out to the Lord and said, We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life. Do not charge us with innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it has pleased you. 
So they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Here is something that is so beautiful. I almost can't even explain it. How much did Jonah pay to ride the whale to go back home? Did he pay anything? It was free, right? But did Jonah pay money to get on the ship? Yes or no? Of course, right? So Jonah pays money to get on the ship, gets himself into a mess, but then salvation to take him back from this storm was free. The will was free. See, you can't buy salvation. You can't earn it. You can't work for it. Jonah didn't do anything to bring this sea creature. God is the one that saves Jonah. Jonah didn't purchase a ticket for the fish. The sailors were in the boat and they were they were rowing and they were trying. And, and the original Hebrew actually says that they dug deep. They dug. That's the word for rowing. They dug deep. They tried and they're digging and they're trying and they can't because salvation is not something you can work towards. No matter how hard you try or how much you want it, you want to do it by yourself. You, It's an impossibility. It is an impossibility to save yourself. Jonah doesn't purchase a ticket to salvation. The whale comes for free. So Jonah says, chuck me in the water. And the sailors say, no, 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 we're going to save you. Again, wait a second. What? The polytheistic Gentiles that didn't believe in, in Jehovah, that didn't believe in Yahweh, they're the ones that are like, whoa, no, 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 no. We're not going to throw you in. That would be wrong. These are Gentiles. And, they be, and they're acting more righteous than Jonah? I want to tell you something. There's good people in the world who have never stepped in a church. And there's some rotten people inside a church. I've met some. Maybe you have. Maybe you've met some. There's some non-Christian Christians. But there's also a lot of Christian non-Christians. God is working with everyone everywhere. So I love this verse in Ephesians chapter 2, um, verses 8 and 9. Let me just share this again. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works. Can you say amen? Even if you were to gather up everything holy, everything good, everything lovely in you, and you were to present them as a gift to God, it would be like tattered shreds. It would be like dust. We are saved by grace alone, by faith alone. Here's one of my favorite ways to say this. I've, I've said this to people before. Was Jesus a sinner? Yes or no? No. Was Jesus treated like a sinner? Yes. Now, let's do the flip. Are you righteous? No. But are you treated as righteous? Yes. So here, so I need you to follow with, follow with me. The sin that condemned Jesus was just as much his as the righteousness which saves you is yours. That's it. The sin that condemns Jesus belongs to him as much as the righteousness that saves you belongs to you. In other words, you do not have any righteousness. Just as Jesus had no sin, you are not righteous. You're saved through faith alone. See, we feel pretty comfortable saying Jesus had no sin, but we should feel similarly uncomfortable saying that we are righteous because we're not. We're so far the opposite way. We should feel similarly uncomfortable saying that I am righteous or that I've earned my salvation. We haven't earned anything. God has earned it and we believe in it. See, Jonah couldn't pay for the salvation. He didn't pay for the whale. When they tried to row back to shore, they couldn't. It only comes for free. God's salvation is free, and it comes to everyone, not just to Jonah. It comes to everyone. As soon as Jonah is in the water, now the Gentiles are praising God. Verse Chapter 1, verse 17. Ooh, I love this. Verse 17. Uh, oh, sorry, verse 16. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. They are now worshiping the God of Jonah. And we might think, we might think that we're running away horizontally. We might think we're going to Tarshish, but in reality, when we run from God, we're only going down to the grave. We're going down. Jonah thought, oh, I'm moving horizontal. This does not affect my walk with God. I'm doing fine. 
Not only are you not doing fine when you sin, you are on the path to death. You're going down to the grave. Jonah thought he was moving west, but in reality, he's going down to the grave. And the question for you, are you going to go up or down? Will you go up or will you go down? Because you being in the bottom of the ship, sleeping, will absolutely affect and endanger the, the lives of the people around you. Last point that I'll make. Jonah was not neutral in the fact that he rejected what God asked him to do. Now he's causing a storm to come on innocent Gentile believers. So Jonah wasn't on the boat, neutral, horizontal, neutral. He definitely wasn't positive. He was sleeping. He was creating a negative effect. And when you reject God, you create a negative effect for the people around you. You negatively affect their lives. When you walk away from God, you create storms in the lives of the people around you. That's what Jonah did. See, if he would not have been on that boat, the Gentiles would have been much better off. When you reject God and walk away from God, you are going down to your own death, to, to the grave. You're walking down. You think it's horizontal, but it's actually vertical. And you endanger the lives of the people around you. You endanger their spiritual connections with God. You endanger their, um, their livelihoods. You are affecting the people around you in a worse way. I want to encourage you to go up. God calls you a rise. To arise and go. Arise and go talk to Gentiles. To go talk to those people, those disgusting people, those icky people, right? Disgusting in quotes. Of course, they're not actually disgusting. Go talk to the people that we are uncomfortable talking to. Go talk to them. That's what God calls us to do. Get up and follow me. You might be aware in the book of Revelation, there's a verse that says, these are those who follow the lamb wherever he goes. Because Jesus... In the case of Jonah, Jesus was headed to Nineveh, and Jonah wanted to run the opposite way. So if you're going to follow Jesus, you're going to have to go to uncomfortable places. Are you going to go up, or are you going to go down? If you're going to go up, if you're going to follow Jesus, it might be difficult. But Nineveh with God is safer than Tarshish without him. I want to encourage you, if you want to go up, just say with Jesus, say to Jesus right now, God, I don't want to go down. I want to go up. I want to follow you. I want to follow you. Even if it means following you to death, that's better than running away from you into my own demise. And I don't want to give a bad name to, to Christ by acting like, a, by claiming to be a Christian. I want you to tell Jesus, I don't want to give a bad name to Christ because I claim to be a Christian, but I'm not acting like one in my local community because I'm asleep at the bottom of the boat. And then we're going to pray. Would you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, God, I pray that you would do whatever it takes in my life. This, this was a sermon for me. Pray that you would do whatever it takes. Humble me. Help me to realize how badly I need to follow you. I need to follow you wherever you go. Help me not to see the people that are in my life that don't know you as different from me or dissimilar from me. Help me to see them as your sons and daughters because you love them and you're working with everyone, everywhere. Lord, you're there before I'm there. Pray that you would get me out of my comfort zone, lift me up, help me to arise and to go. Help me to share Jesus with the people around me. Shake me up. Don't let me be stagnant. Let me follow you. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I pray that this was a blessing for you. And next week we're going to be studying part three. And um, just encourage you that if you're being dead weight in the bottom of a boat, ask God to wake you up. Ask him to speak to you through your friends, through your neighbors. We don't want to run from God. We want to run to him. God bless you all, and I pray that you have a beautiful and happy rest of your Sabbath.